Hello there, this is Mick Box of Uriah Heap, and you are listening to Sonic Perspectives. Some 53 years ago, a group of British lads got together to bring hard rock and metal music to the masses. They called themselves Uriah Heap, after a fairly slimy character in the novel David Copperfield. There have been a lot of changes over the year, particularly in personnel, but Heap is still going strong with their new album, Chaos and Color. And that's a British color with the U in the middle of it. The one constant, if you will, has been their lead guitarist, Mick Box. And he's been around since the beginning during Famine and Feast. I'm Mark Boardman of Sonic Perspectives. Mick Box is with us today. Mick, welcome to Sonic Perspectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, my friend. You know, here we are speaking all the way from London uh, in my home, so I'm delighted. And here's <laughs> delighted speaking here. from greater Indianapolis, so we've got a, a wide connection going. Happy days. <clears throat> Talking with a few friends who have heard the album, in addition to my listening to it, we tend to think this is maybe the strongest heap album in years. What's your assessment? Um, I know it, it's very hard for me to be judgmental like that. Sure. Um, but in all fairness, I think that we 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 laid down the um, the foundation with with Living the Dream, our previous studio album, um, produced by Jay Rustin again, and um, we brought him on board for this one. And I think because we grew we grew with our relationship there, I think we obviously stepped up a bit further with this one, you know. So I think it definitely raises the bar from Living the Dream. Mm-hmm. Um, and also there's more, more um, writing um, credits from other members of the band, like uh, our drummer, Russell Gilbert, had a friend, Simon, he used to play, you know, he plays guitar, so they, they got together. Dave Rimmer has got a great friend called Jeff Scott Soto, who sings in Sons of Apollo. They, yes. they, they, they got the Save Me Tonight, which is our lead single. And uh, Phil Lanz and the keyboard player and myself wrote the rest of them. So it was, um, I think it's a very strong album as much as, it encompasses everything that the heap's known for the five part harmonies, the hammered organ, the interplay with the hammered organ, my wah wah guitar, if you like, you know, distinctive lead vocals and positive lyrics. You know, I think it kind of, um, it's a good calling card if you're just coming into your eye because you probably get everything in one right there. <laughs> yes. yes. <clears throat> when you go into the recording studio, are all the songs prepared at that point or do you do some more composition while you're in there? No, we don't. We 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 tend to have everything. Um, we we do a, a pre-production, mm-hmm. um, and we take a bit of time sifting through the songs, arrangements, and everything else. Then we send them over to our producer Joe Rustin in Los Angeles. He has a listen, makes a few comments. They come back, and then by the time we get in the studio, we're just looking to get good feel, good sounds, good performances. You know, rather than tinkering with the songs. Occasionally, things might change a little bit. I mean, for instance, on One Nation, One Sun, which is the, the big ballad, yep. um, I wrote that all on acoustic guitar, the, the, the mu- music, and then I gave it over to um, Phil Lanz and the keyboard player, he put the, the melody on, then we wrote the lyrics together. Mm-hmm. But it was all on acoustic guitar. But when we got in the studio, I, I didn't think it was speaking correctly with the lead voice and the, and, and the, the, the acoustic guitar. It sounded a bit too folky. Yes. So we put it on piano, and once we got the piano, it was very insular, and it, it was it was saying the right things to me. And of course, Heaps had, in its history, a lot of good piano songs, like you know, uh, Rain and um, Easy Road and, and songs like that. So um, they're the, they're the only changes that make, you know, the, um, sonically rather than you know arrangement wise, you know. When somebody brings a song in, does it automatically? sound like Uriah Heep or is it like the one you mentioned where let's let's do a little tinkering here and there so that it is definably Heep? I think the minute we start playing any song it becomes Heep you know it, it just it just because that's the template we established back in 1970 and um, I think it continues today you know and all we do is apply it to new songs and and with someone like Jay Rustin at the helm with the producer's seat he kind of brings a freshness to it all as well which is really cool um so yeah um and, and he's also very aware of our heritage and he you know he packages that all into one big bundle it sounds fantastic you know he's really great mm-hmm. several of the <laughs> songs reference sun and sunlight and light and freedom and being saved and that sort of thing are these concepts that came out 
because of the quarantine, because of COVID, or were you headed in this direction anyway? I think we've always been, you know, we've always been in that direction, you know, um, you know, writing about sunshine is, is, is it way better than writing about um, anything dark and mm -hmm. I, I don't get a lot of the dark, mysterious stuff that goes down, you know, I'd rather be a, uh, I'm, I'm a smiley guy, you know, and I like to have, uh, uh, I like to have positive um, messages in their lyrics, you know, so we may be talking like Sammy tonight is talking about COVID, but it's also talking, you know, it's got a, a, a positive energy to it, you know, and a positive lyric at the end to it, you know, so um, I think it's all important for you to have that. And when we go around the world and I do live concerts, you know, I get many people coming up to me saying, Mick, I want to shake your hand. Thank you for the music. But, you know, I've been some, through some really difficult times in my life, but, you know, your music's helped me get through. And I think that's because of the, you know, definitely the, the positive lyrical content in most of our songs. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a great affirmation for you guys to know that it's beyond just, you know, they can tap their feet to it and raise their fist, but it actually can do something to help them. <clears throat> Well, I think that's that's very true. I mean, the, the, the tap of your foot and raise your fist is usually from the musicality, isn't it? Um, but, you know, if you can put some great lyrics on top and tell a, 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 a story or an inspirational story, then that's all the better, you know, because th then people can connect with it on every possible level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, did the quarantine impact the band that much other than having to shift the 50th anniversary stuff to a few years later? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, of course it did. It, it disrupted everybody's life, didn't it? And there was so much uncertainty going on. You didn't know whether it was going to end um, or where we were going with it at times. You know, it was very frustrating for everybody, you know, but we, I can't I can't see that as too much of a negative because, you know, lots of other people had way, way more trouble than us. You know, businesses were folding. Um, people couldn't see their loved ones in hospital and things like that. You know, my heart went out to them. Um, I was lucky enough not to have, you know, not to address those problems. Um, so I, w what happened was, you know, there was a big hole came into my life with um, not touring, um, although it was unfortunate, it was frustrating as well. And, um, but I could be home with my family, which is good. Um, and, and I'm one of these guys in a big hole appears, I'll fill it up with something else, you know? So I did a lot of writing. I did a lot of um, music writing. I, I did lockdown diaries for the fans. I did mixed Mondays for the fans. Right. Um, I've got a cancer charity on my um, website and I did all those cameo things, you know, wishing people the best and stuff, you know, with that. Yeah. So that was really cool, you know. So I had time to to divert into that and give it all my energies, which, which was cool. Mm -hmm. When you're sitting down and writing like that and you've got a little bit more time than you nat uh, naturally have planned for it, <clears throat> You ever come up with stuff that you say that's not heap? It's good, but it's not heap. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's 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 lots of times, you know. That I'm sorry, my dog's my dog's got his paw on my guitar. And he's trying to play domino. No, no. <laughs> sorry, uh, he's trying to play. He's trying to find the lost chord. I think, <laughs> <laughs> and it remains lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, where were we? Where were we? You were asking uh, what? I was asking if you wrote some things and you said, "Well, that's not heap." Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Loads of times, you know. But you know, it's, you, you, you write. You, I'm a, I'm a writer. I write every day. I write something, yes. a lyric, a title, a chord sequence, or something, you know. Um, and it's very important for me to do that. You know, it's my, my releasing life, if you like, you know, and um, makes me really happy. So you know, I've written lots of stuff that could be film music on it. But you know, it's important to 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 exploit everything other than heap, you know. So yeah, I do lots of things, like lots of folky things and. And you know, all sorts of stuff, you know. And uh, when it's time for heap an album, then I, I present all the stuff that that, that is obviously heap. <laughs> Will the other stuff ever see the light of day? Um, do you know what? I don't care if it does or doesn't. It's it's just important for me to get it out of my system. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can be walking the dog, um, you know, through the park and and come up with an idea, and you just get the the, the iPhone out and sing it into there, you know, new stockpile them, and then I think to myself, you know. Well, I've got a bit of time now, like I did COVID. Let's go through all those ideas. And like like everything in life, in those ideas, you'll have like, say you've got 20 and about four or five will jump up as being quite special. And they're the ones you work on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me about this album is it's <laughs> very fresh and yet there are certainly um, connections to the past. Um, the last song, Closer to Your Dreams, 
has that sort of shuffle that Uriah Heep is known yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. It takes it back to easy living or even look at yourself. Uh, that really is one of the trademarks for the band. Yeah, we, we we did that as a bit of fun, to be fair. Did you? <laughs> yeah, we just said, you know, we 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 got most of the you know, songs written, and and Phil Lands and myself, the keyboard player, myself, we said let's let's just let's just do something with the shuffle. We haven't done one for ages, and um, and the thing about the shuffle is that Easy Living is a very unique shuffle to Lee Kerslake, who's departing now. God bless him, you know, my best mate, and. Um, he, he, yeah, other bands have copied, you know, when they, when they play Easy Living, they never quite get the shuffle right. But Russ is, is a, a, a very competent player and yeah. he, he pick it up and he can play it very, very well. So we thought, well, let's capitalize on that and do something with that. And also, with the closer your dream, I think lyrically, it's we, we're throwing down the gauntlet for people to stop sharing files all over the place and start being bands again, you know. <laughs> And, and I think that's kind of where we're at with that, closer to your room. You know, and, and, and I think one of the lyrics is, what is it? Um, are you strong enough to take the ride? You know, because this, yeah. you know, one of the sayings we have in this business is one door opens, another one slams in your face, you know, and, and it's your belief in yourself that sees you through them. <laughs> yeah. So you you don't do a lot of sharing of files with the other band members? Sorry, did I? You, you talked about telling other bands, come on, stop sharing the files and get going with it. Yeah, you, yeah, I, yeah I, think, I think we should get back to that. You know, I think it's got very individualist, you know, in, in many ways, you know. And, and the great thing about the, the a lot of the 70s bands, including ourselves, is that the, the music has stood the test of time. And I think one of those reasons is that, that everyone was an individual within the bands and it's each individual band had their own flavor. For instance, you know, I didn't, you know, if we look at Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, I didn't play like Tony Iommi, he didn't play like me, he didn't play like Richie Blackmore, Richie Blackmore didn't play like Jimmy Page. And all the guitarists, all the instrumentalists, all the bass players, all the drummers, all the keyboard players and all the vocalists were all individual. And it's the sum of those parts that gave Deep Purple their sound, your eye heap its sound, Black Sabbath its sound, and Led Zeppelin their sound, you know. And I think today it's a bit too um, samey. Mm -hmm. I think you could take one person there and put him in there and you wouldn't know any difference. Mm -hmm. put, him in, put him in there and it wouldn't be any difference. It's like a big jigsaw. You take the pieces out, you can put it in anywhere and it'll all fit. Whereas in those days, you know, we were too individual and we, we worked really hard at being that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, you know, I think that's why those bands have the longevity they have. And certainly in, in people's listening, you know, parlours, if you like, you know, yeah. home, cars and everywhere else. One of the things... The constant of you, um, you can tell your guitar playing because it's got wah-wah here, a little bit of reverb here. One thing that you have not done, what I've seen over the years, is more and more guitar players running up and down the fretboard as fast as they can to put a thousand notes where one might just uh, do for the listener. Yeah, I, I, it's not my style, you know. I mean, I... I... You know, it's like playing guitar like a typewriter, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know um, I, I just don't see it like that. I mean, to, to me, um, when you're soloing, you know, um, song is the king. So you solo to enhance the the song. You don't do it to overtake it and show you what your latest licks are, you know. And I think a lot of people overplay it. Um, uh, but that's not my style. You know, I like to live within the song and do the best for the song. Mm -hmm. How spontaneous are the solos that you come up with? Um, some of them, um, I, I tend to go in the studio with the producer and I'll have sketched three or four solos. And I'll, I'll, then the first thing you do is play those three or four ideas. And then um, one will stick out you know, as the direction to go in. And then you just hone that down and you're off, you know. Mm -hmm. It never, never take many takes, you know, I, I think you, in fact, um, one of the songs, uh, what was it? Oh, Silver Sunlight. Mm -hmm. As I was writing the, the music, uh, the solo flowed out. So, so all I did was, I had, all I had to do is just keep it, you know, and, and hone it down a bit, you know, maybe shorten it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was all there. It just came out as almost as another musical part. So, you know, sometimes it happens like that. Sometimes it doesn't. But generally, I like to have three or four sketch pads of solos for the producer and me to hone in. When it comes out just like that, that must be a pretty cool feeling. 
Yeah, but it is. It's fantastic. You know, you, you love it when it when it when it hits. You know, and I and I, you know, I, I mean, when you're saying the wah wah guitar, see the wah wah. I use the wah in a very unique way. I use it I, and as a wah. You know, wah wah wah. wah. Yeah. Um, I also use it as a pitch bend. So when I'm bend a string up, I'm putting the foot down, and you get a a frequency that cuts through um beautifully over the band over the top of the band and really that came out of live work because live work if you think about it i've got the bass guitar over there on the left i've got the keyboard hammond organ left loud bass end and i've got two double bass drums loud bass bass end so i have to find a frequency that sits on that to get my single note stuff out and the wild wild gives me that you know so yeah. you know the wild has been good to me and i've uh, ever since jeff beck's truth album mm -hmm. where I, I i first heard it where he made made it talk um yeah. you know i went out and bought one i've been one ever since you know and if i could make them into shoes i'd walk around the forest with my dog wiring all over the place <laughs> <laughs> i bet you get a lot of stares for that <laughs> i certainly would but never mind <laughs> what, what is that weird guy with the white hair doing with his dog yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can we take it back 53 years back when you and <clears throat> david basically put your eye together it was spice before that and then you ended up adding the keyboards and that probably yeah. was the defining moment was the keyboard addition in part because of what john lord had already done with deep purple no not at all no um basically what it was um we were a four piece of spice and we were called spice because as you know in the culinary world there's many many spices and we didn't want our music to be just one genre so um we call ourselves spice so then we went to the studio as a four piece and when we recorded all our original songs i was thinking that maybe just maybe some keyboards will you know embellish it nicely sure. and give it another flavor so we tried a a, um, a school teacher friend um, of our, our manager and producer at the time jerry Bron, and the guy came in and put a few things down and thought yeah this is the direction we need to go in now i was a big fan of vanilla fudge yes in my time and uh, he was it, to, to me he was way in front of anyone else he was just superb and so i thought oh well, the hammered organ is going to be great be because it's one of those instruments that can be very gentle very bluesy be rocky soulful metal met 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 if you like you know it can really really raw and i thought well that that will go with it you know all, all the um nuances of our songs and so the hammered organ is the way to go and of course vanilla fudge had those really high falsetto harmonies that we we were doing at the same time as well. So it kind of all gelled together as a great idea. And once we started putting keyboards on, we thought, hell, we know maybe we've we've changed the musical template. Now let's change the name of the band. So we changed to Your Eye Heat. Yeah. Uh, of course, mentioning Deep Purple, they must have had an influence from Vanilla Fudge as well, because <laughs> their first hit song in their first configuration was a Vanilla Fudge cover so yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah i never thought of it like that to be honest yeah. so but the funny the thing is back, the start. yeah but back in, in in the day in london you know um we were we were in a rehearsal studio in hamwell community center in acton in london and it wasn't a rehearsal studio it was just like two school halls if you like mm -hmm. and deep purple in one and you're right we're in the other so <laughs> without <laughs> even knowing each other yeah. and it was quite amazing it was a hell of a noise coming out of that <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you know, nevertheless, some great music came out of it too. You know, um, yeah. So you know, we've known the guys for ages. They're they're great people, good friends, and you know, we always, you know, when we do get comparisons, we always point out, look, we've got five singers. You know, they've got one. You know, yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, with our harmony work, you know, um, I think that stands as a part. You know, and we, they went the virtuoso work the road, if you like, and we went the song road. You know, so it kind of. Um, I can see the only similarity really is that we're playing loud rock music and both then have an organ and that was about yeah. it you know they're great guys. guys great guys you know we've always gotten great with them when i first heard look at yourself which <laughs> hates me a little bit i suppose and those five part harmonies come rising up in the back it reminded me of banshees and it sent a, a <laughs> my back it really was something pretty amazing for that time yeah basically I mean, we started on our first album if you think if you go back to the song gypsy yeah um we used the harmonies almost as another instrument mm -hmm. it is a big block harmony that comes in 
bang, this big harmony. Mm-hmm. And so to us, it was, it was it was a great feeling to do that, you know, because coming out of the late 60s, harmony was just singing sweetly with a chorus or who's and ours somewhere, mm-hmm. you know, and we brought it into a, a an area where it could be used as another instrument. And um, and that was, you know, a lot of people, other bands got turned on by that as well, you know, and, and, and took it further. Yeah. It, it was hard for me to believe, but when I went back and was looking through some of my files and mm-hmm. listening to some of the old albums, Demons and Wizards, Magician's Birthday, the live album and Sweet Freedom all came out within about one year. How did you get that done? That's impossible to do nowadays. I think in 1972, and we we definitely recorded Demons and Wizards and Magician's Birthday in the same year. Yeah. As well as doing long tours, you know, I don't know how we did it, but you know, it was the management pushing and pushing and pushing. You know, um, you know, initially they made the investment, and I guess they were just in those days. We, you know, we were we were always trading new ground everywhere mm-hmm. um, in the music business, and um, so nobody knew. You, um, maybe we should take take the foot off the pedal a bit. Maybe we should. You know, everyone was pushing and going for it. You know, and and so. You know, good side of it is a lot of good music came out of it mm-hmm. you know and um sometimes you know maybe you've had more time to think about something it may be not quite so good because yeah. i'm a firm believer sometimes you make those decisions on the spot mm-hmm. they're usually spot on <laughs> you know because you're, you're not thinking you've not got no diversion you know you just go for the feeling and the emotion of it of the decision you know and i think that's where we were with those two albums mm-hmm. one of the other things that I think people forget about, because there are plenty of people of my age who go back and say, you know, that was the halcyon days for Uriah Heath, probably because they were growing up at that time. But that iteration of the band, the one that had Gary Thane and Dave Byron and Ken Hensley and Lee Kerslake and you, that really only lasted about three years. It, It seemed like it went on longer. Yes, yes, it, it, it does, doesn't it? You know, and when you think of, you know, uh, Bernie Shaw as singer now and, and Keeble Palau, Phil Lanzan now that are on Chaos and Colour, when you think that they've been with me since 1986, it's, it's know. incredible. You know, so they're, they're the longest surviving members, but it's never seen like that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's something, it's something I, 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 I fail to understand, but, you know, that's, that's how people are. Yeah, well, it, I think it's got to be because... Many of us were growing up at that point, and we associate the music of that era with various events in our lives, good, bad, and otherwise. Yeah. Well, I also think that, um, to be honest, in, in those days, um, there was there's not many diversions as they are nowadays, of course. Mm-hmm. I mean, back then, it was either you know, football, music, and fashion really that people got involved in and they were all intrinsically linked as well um whereas nowadays you know you do more than that on your on your iphone you know it's people are just diverted all over the place yeah. with the interesting things you know but back then music was a big part of people's lives and uh, and uh, and you know those special moments well i think that's why those those members are revered because we hit really big at a time when when it was available to hit really big you know um and, and easy living got on the world stage and the music wizards went and the magician's birthday followed and then as you say the live and the sweet freedom it, it was a big snowball that just kept going and going and going you know but i think the world was a different place and it, and it certainly was how you revered music you know i mean you had a tactile lbs lps you put the yes. record on you had to put the needle on you read the the, the cover you framed the cover you yeah. know it, yeah. it was a it was a big thing whereas now it's all you know push button you know on a computer you know i'll hear that oh that's good delete <laughs> you know <laughs> it's a different mindset isn't it but that's the way of the world it is yeah are you back into collecting lps now I've never, never not collected LPs. Oh, you know. okay. <laughs> I've got a huge, I mean, I've got a load of CDs behind me here, but if I go on the other side here, there's all the vinyl and all my recording and all my guitars. So <laughs> <laughs> guilty as charged, sir. <laughs> ah, there you go. But you were ahead of the time in that regard. <laughs> no, I just stayed with the times. <laughs> exactly. The smart guy. You know, I was going through um, a couple of the more recent albums, Choices, which came out, in September of 21, each band member taking 
a variety of the older Uriah Heep songs and oh, put right. it yeah, on yeah. a disc. Yours stood out because it had two, not one, but two songs from Abominog. Now, that album, I assume, means a great deal to you. Well, yeah, it was, um, you know, we, we'd folded up the Conquest lineup and um, I was kind of moving into a new era um, and I needed I, I needed musicians. And it just so happened I phoned up Lee Kersler uh, to wish him all the best with Ozzy because, um, you know, they were meant to be going to America. And I phoned him up and said, hello, mate, you know, say hello to everyone out there for me and all that stuff. We're still the best of friends, you know. In fact, we're brothers with different mothers, you know, that, that close. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And um, and he said, well, I'm not going. Um, Sharon wants an all-American band. And I said, oh, my God, goodness gracious. I said, well, look, I've just folded this up and I've got um, loads of live work. I've got all the equipment. I've got the rehearsals. I've got the re recording contract. Are you in? He said, well, as long as our manager at the time, Sherry Bond's not involved, I'm in. So I said, no, I'll take care of all that. So he said, well, I'm in then. So I said, hey, hang on. Um, what about Bob? What, what's he doing? And, and of course, we phoned up Bob Daisley and he came in quickly. So gradually a, a new band was formed. You know, I remember Pete Goby from the auditions. Yep. I remember John Sinclair when we worked with him with the heavy metal kids over in Europe. Mm -hmm. And he was over in LA. LA. I phoned him up and got him over. Um, Pete was just going off to... Dallas to do a little tour with Trapeze, uh, but he came back and he came in. And then in two weeks, we were written in Bombardog. And we went in, recorded it, had the greatest of time together. And it went top 40 in America. And the next minute, we're out in America. Um, we got um, The Way That Is, I think, written by Paul Bliss, was on that album. That was um, on the, at the beginning of MTV with the, the videos. And so we had a, a high rotation of eight times a day on there. Then we jumped on the Def Leppard tour, and they were the biggest thing since sliced bread out there at the time, uh -huh. because they 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 just hit with um, pour some sugar on me, I think, on MTV. So that was good. So we went out and had the greatest time. Yeah, it was marvelous. Yeah, yeah, it's sort of like a new life for the band. And it was a complete, complete, um, complete new life. Yeah, uh, and uh, that was it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting close to time here. I know. Well, you, over the the past couple of years, the band has lost a couple of its heritage members in yeah. Lee Kerslake and Ken Hensley. Um, and so, John Lawton. Oh, and we John knew Lawton. that Lee had been pretty sick. Ken's was a little bit more of a surprise, I guess. Um, when you think of <laughs> them, do you mostly have positive thoughts about their contributions to, to your eye hip? Because they were also in there during some turbulent times. Yeah, I mean... Uh... As you, as you rightfully said, Lee was was a, a long term five year illness, and I was always phoning him, keeping in touch, going to see him, and stuff like that. In fact, when he was having treatments, I was I had him on the phone, and I was telling him jokes, and he said, "I'm I'm in a room full of doom, and you're making me laugh," and they're wondering what's going on. So that was really, you know, we 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 had that sort of camaraderie. But Ken and John Lawton, of course, um, they, they both went very quickly. And, and it was literally no build up at all. Shocking, you know, but the, the thing is, I'm, I'm, I've been left here to wave the flag and by keeping things going and having a new album like Chaos in Colour, it, it, it keeps everything revitalised. Um, and lots of young musicians, your musicians can be inspired by the songs and playing and singing that they left behind in Mother Earth. So it's all good in that regard. So I, I just had to find an inspirational way of carrying on. And that, that's the reasoning. Because they're making yours consider your own mortality of course it does you know but we try and um you know fall john and 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 enjoy every day as it as it as it comes you know and and I, I never put any brick walls in front of me about retirement or anything like that i'm still writing we've got the new album out i'm still writing songs today for the next one so um then we'll go out and tour i mean in april Bernie Shaw and I are going out with a 40-piece orchestra in Germany called Rock Meets Classic, and we're doing that with Joey Tempest from Europe and Dee Schneider from Twisted Sister. It's going to be a great run. Uh, we did it previously with Alice Cooper as well, which is marvellous. And uh, he used to warm up to Lady in Black, one of our songs. Oh, really? uh, songs for Salisbury. And uh, also we used to get up every night and do schools out with him. So how good is that, you know? <laughs> Rocking out with Alice. Uh, who's a great guy, I must say. Um, yeah, so we'll keep busy. We're doing summer festivals and then we'll start the intensive touring of Chaos and Colour, of course. You know, it's a busy time, a good time, though. 
It, it is, you know, and we've just come off the, you know, before Christmas, we were doing the 50th anniversary, which was a three hour show and the acoustic set, electric set, um, loads of film footage, uh, a heat museum in the foyer where I stripped my house of every, every accolade we've ever had. And it was in the foyer of every museum, uh, every, every venue, sorry, and terms as a museum. And uh, that was great fun, you know, and we played 36 shows in 17 countries. And so, you know, right now we're on a hiatus, but we're doing all the, as you can see here, all the promo for the Chaos and Colour in the hope we can come out in America and play. Well, I hope so, too. I have to mention it has been 50 years since I saw you guys in Indianapolis performing. It was one of the funnest concerts. I Funnest. Yeah, well, whatever. Yeah, yeah that's a good word. <laughs> It was a great. It wasn't was back in with with because uh, our first American um, tour and the first show ever in America was Indianapolis with uh, Three Dog Night. Uh, no, this one was with Edgar Winters, White Trash. Oh yeah, yeah, how oh, great too that was. Yeah, yeah, they were great. It was a riot outside of the the hall from people who were trying to get in. It was. Uh... Yeah, you know, I loved it because you know we we there was um one time um you know it wasn't pigeonhole music was it it was just either good or bad back then. Yeah. And I used to love the you know, the one two we did was Uriah Heap, Earth Wind and Fire, and ZZ Top. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I mean magic you know and the great thing is you're not you're not playing to the converted you know you're turning on their audience they're all you know they're they're turning on your audience you know it's marvelous you know but it was only good and bad music then we didn't have the the promoter mentality now whether you get three classic rock bands three metal bands three folk bands you know yeah. but or, you know or that's the way it's gone my friend one type yeah well mick it has been such a pleasure to talk with you today um it has been a pleasure to listen to your music for 53 years. Oh, thank you, mate. Happy days. Oh, and I know that I'm going to enjoy listening to Chaos and Color even more over the next few days and Brilliant. certainly around for your next uh, album when it comes out. Lovely. Mick he is the original lead guitarist for the legendary group Uriah Heep. Their newest album, as we mentioned, is called Chaos and Color. Mick, thanks for being with us very much today. Thank you a lot, my friend. Happy days. I'm Mark Boardman. For the latest news, reviews, and interviews, turn to Sonic Perspectives.